Never 
Well, good morning. Welcome to Swan Creek Baptist Church and to our online ministry. Uh, so thankful that you were able to tune in today, and I pray that you would be uh, built up in the Lord today, encouraged in His Word. My prayer is that our hearts would just be in tune with whatever the Spirit of God wants to say, whatever the Spirit of God wants to do, that you and I would be able to just focus on the Lord. We would worship Him. We would cry out to Him in prayer today. And we would draw near to Him on purpose. So let's pray. Let's commit this time to the Lord. Thank you again for joining us. Father, thank you so much uh, for the privilege to know you, Lord, to be able to uh, walk with you daily. Uh, Lord, we know that this is all a gift, a grace gift. And Lord, we know it's possible through the Lord Jesus Christ only. Uh, Lord, we never could have earned our way to you. Uh, certainly never would have deserved a, a relationship with you, Lord, but you provided it by grace through faith. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for the Lord Jesus, for the finished work of the cross. And my prayer is that your people, Lord, would, would worship you today because you were worthy of our worship. And Lord, we would not be distracted by the things around the house or the things going on in our world. But Lord, we would be focused on you. We would hear from you. So Lord, minister today, please. Take us forward for you. In Jesus' name, amen. To, to fast and pray on behalf of the Poplins. Church family, tonight we want to invite you to tune in on Facebook or YouTube just for a time of worship. Uh, we will be worshiping the Lord in song 
and we will be worshiping the Lord through scripture meditation. So again, this will be tonight, 6 p.m. on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, please tune in and encourage others to do the same. We are going to be celebrating uh, Miss Helen Swain and her 100th birthday. And church family, I want to encourage you to be a part of this. It'll be Sunday, January 24th. It's going to be a drive-through birthday party. Uh, we're going to be driving through Hugh Chatham Nursing Center and just waving and, and honking and, and uh, just wanting to encourage Miss Helen in the Lord. So I trust that you'll be a part of this if possible. Again, this is Sunday, January 24th. Uh, we'll start driving through about 2 p.m. at Chatham Nursing Center. I do want to encourage you with our midweek uh, Bible studies. Uh, so thankful for um, our Tuesday night study, the prayer time. Uh, boy, it's been great. And I praise the Lord for, for you, church, and, and your faithfulness there. Uh, maybe you have not had an opportunity to tune in to one of these Zoom Bible studies. It's very easy. You just get on our website and then just click the link for Zoom, and it will do the rest. So we are studying the protocols of prayer, almost done with this study, and really already looking forward to our next study that will begin on February the 9th. And the study's topic will be renewing our mind in a mindless world. So look forward to this. This study will be on campus here at church starting February the 9th. That's a Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, we will uh, be online, Lord willing, and so we'll be videoing, but also having in-person uh, Bible study and prayer time. So look forward to this starting February the 9th. We do need some help around the church. Uh, we've got Christmas decorations to, to get down, so if you can help, we're gonna be uh, working together Wednesday morning 10 a.m. So this coming Wednesday at 10 a.m., please come out and help us take down Christmas decorations if you're available. Also going to be ministering uh, in the fellowship hall through painting. And so if you can jump in and help us uh, get the fellowship hall uh, fixed up and, and up and running again, we really would appreciate that. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer where you can call the church office and let us know that you can uh, minister uh, through painting down in the fellowship hall. So please get with us about that right away. We want to be much in prayer this month for uh, the, for the Mercers. Um, they are our missionary of the month. So Mr. Allen and Ms. Miriam Mercer uh, ministering in South Africa. So please uh, be praying for them and their ministry there. And let's reach out to them and try to be an encouragement to the Mercers. All right. Thank you again for being with us. I pray the Lord would encourage you and that you would just continue to, to seek his face. Lord bless you, church. King Solomon says that there is a time and a season for everything. Well, as some of you know, Tina and myself find ourselves in a new season. Uh, due to some family obligations, uh, we feel that God has called us uh, off of the field uh, there in South Africa to continue ministering here in uh, the states and to help take care of some some family issues but we need your help church family we would like to ask that you would join us next saturday uh, from 9 to 12 uh, in a time of prayer and fasting and just seeking the lord's will finding out what our next step what our next season is going to be we ask that you would uh, join us in this if you have any questions please see pastor scott all right, well, I want to echo what Brother Rod said about uh, the, the day we have set aside for prayer. Again, this is this coming Saturday, Saturday the 23rd. We're going to meet here at the church and seek the Lord's face on behalf of the Poplins. Uh, so thankful uh, for the ministry that God gave them there in South Africa. And again, so thankful for the Lord's direction, directing them back here to Swan Creek. But they are just uh, wanting to seek the Lord's will his perfect plan for their lives and we want to partner with them in this so this will be next saturday morning here at the church from 9 a.m to noon uh, we're going to have a time of singing uh, we're going to have a time of, of scripture reading 
and especially a time of prayer. Uh, this will be corporate prayer, individual prayer, uh, just really looking forward to a wonderful time of seeking the Lord's face. We are calling for the church to fast and pray. So if you can, if you're physically able, uh, we want to encourage you to fast. So instead of taking uh, that time to eat, we want to put aside the food and really just devote our attention on prayer. Again, showing our, our, our need to hear from the Lord. Uh, so join us with this. If you're not able to fast, please, no big deal there. Please come and pray. And next Saturday from uh, 9 a.m. to 12 noon, we'll meet here at the church. Lord bless you. I will.
So let's go together, please. Deuteronomy chapter 17, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Lord willing, we will be back on campus uh, next week. So again, I want to encourage you. Um, we've taken every step we can to be as safe as possible. And we're just going to trust the Lord with the rest. So you be back in church next week. Uh, we'll look forward to, to worshiping the Lord together right here on campus. Let's go now. Deuteronomy 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, if we don't love God's Word, if we don't spend the time in the Word, we're not going to see the Lord shape us and mold us into the image of Christ. So we must love the Word. We must love the Word and spend the time that is necessary for the Word to shape our lives. Look with me at Psalms 119, verse 97. The psalmist says, Oh, how I love your law. It, again, talking about the Word. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. 
So we can see clearly from the scriptures that the word of God had a, a place of prominence, a place of preeminence in the psalmist's life. He starts the psalm with, oh, how I love your law. See, the Lord, by His grace, had brought the psalmist along to this point. Again, it was by the Lord's grace, by the Lord's strength, that the psalmist had this type of desire for the Word of God. And it's going to be God's grace and strength that brings us along. That we too would have that longing for the Word. That's what God wants for us. God wants us to want His Word. God wants us to hunger and thirst after His Word. I believe God wants us to have an accurate view of how valuable our Bible is. To understand the transforming power of the Word of God. For you and for me to be able to have the same testimony as a psalmist and say, Oh, how I love the Word. So Christian, I ask you this morning, what is your attitude towards the Bible? And again, this might be a, a difficult question for you because we, we need to be humble, we need to be honest, and we know what the answer should be, but again, we must be humble and honest before the Lord and let answer the question before the Holy Spirit, what is my, my attitude towards the Bible? What is my attitude towards church? What is my attitude towards the, the preaching portion of the church service? What is my attitude towards the, the preaching and teaching of God's Word? Again, let's just before the Lord just be humble. Let's just be honest. Let's don't give the answer that we know we should give. Let's give the honest answer. What's my attitude towards Sunday school? What's my attitude towards the, the Tuesday night or the Wednesday night Bible study? What's my heart attitude towards daily devotions? In her biography of her husband, Goforth of China, Rosalind Goforth, she recounted how in the final years of her husband's ministry, Jonathan, her husband, lost his sight. He was no longer able to preach to crowds like he had once done. So Dr. Goforth devoted his time to personal evangelism. He evangelized those who would come to visit him. Mr. and Mrs. Goforth, they, they hired a Chinese companion to assist Dr. Goforth. Rosalind wrote, One of Mr. Ko's chief duties was to read the Chinese Bible aloud to Dr. Goforth. Sometimes, as he read very quickly, a character would be overlooked or miscalled. To his amazement, Dr. Goforth never failed to detect the error and quietly checked him up. He was so familiar with the Chinese Bible. See, Jonathan Goforth, he had a, he had a passion for the Word of God. Whether the, the Word of God was translated in English or the Word of God was translated in Chinese, Jonathan Goforth had a passion for the Scriptures. He had a love for the Word. And this is what God wants to develop in your heart, believer. A love for the Word of God. A passion to, to hear from the Lord through His eternal word. My prayer is that you'll never get over the fact that you and I, we hold the very word of God in our hands. And when we've got all we need to obey, right here on the pages of scriptures, we've got all we need to, to please our God. It's right here on the pages of Scripture, God has give us, given us His forever settled in heaven word. 
It's amazing. But church, God has not just called us to revere the Bible, even though we should revere, we should respect the Word of God. God has not just given us the call to revere the Word, but God wants us to read the Word. God wants you and He wants me to, to study the Word, to memorize and meditate. God wants us to implement the Word. Yet, so often, rather than loving it and allowing it to, to truly live in our hearts, too often the Bible just takes its place along with other things that compete for our time and for our devotion. We can just be honest, can't we? We struggle. We go through periods of time where we don't read, where we don't meditate. We go through periods of time where we feel like the Word is just kind of dry. And I want to encourage you, friend. You can be honest before the Lord. You can tell Him when you're struggling to be in the Word. You can tell Him when you're, when you're struggling to, to keep the Word a priority in your life and the life of your, your family. You can talk to the Lord honestly. See, God wants His Word, the hearing of His Word, whether it's through preaching or, or teaching or, or through your personal devotions, God wants it to be a delight. Jeremiah 15. Look at Jeremiah's testimony. Your words were found, and I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. See, God wants to give me this, this attitude towards his word. God wants to develop this in me and, and develop this in you. He wants the word to be our delight. The preaching and the teaching of, of, of His Word to be something we long to sit under. See, the fact that sports scores, stats, political news is more interesting to us than, than the Word reveals a, a hardening in our heart towards the Bible. The fact that, that the latest gossip is more interesting to us than the Word of God, that, that reveals a hardening in our hearts towards the Bible. And again, tell it to Jesus, Christian. We've got to quit putting on this facade like we've got it all together and, and that we can front the Lord. We can just be honest with Him about what our relationship is with the Bible. Tell it to Jesus. Tell the Lord about your struggle to be in the Word faithfully. Tell the Lord about the lack of longing in your soul for the Word. Tell it to Jesus. Allow Him to enter into your battle, into your struggle. Because when I allow the Lord in, He always ministers to me grace and strength. James chapter 4 verse 2 says... You have not because you ask not. So maybe that's what the Lord's leading you to do. Maybe the Lord is leading you to ask for a longing for His Word. Maybe the Lord is leading you to ask for the joy, the passion for the Word that you once had. Maybe the Lord wants you to ask again for that afresh. You ask not. Matthew chapter 7 verse 17 says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. So again, my admonition to you, church, is again, ask. Seek from the Lord a passion for His Word again. A longing to hear from Him from the pages of Scripture. Let's just ask the Lord together. Let's ask now. Father, again, you know my heart and you know that this has been heavy on me for some time now. Lord, I cannot make your people love your word. 
Lord, I cannot make my children have a, a passion for the book. Lord, only you can produce this in our hearts. Only you, Lord, can bring us along by your grace that we would love the scriptures, that we would long to hear from you from the word. So, Lord, together we just ask, Lord, would you renew a right spirit in us towards the Bible? Would you give us a fresh longing, please, for the word of God? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we looked at servant leadership and we saw the pattern of the Lord Jesus as that great leader, the greatest leader this world has ever known, a servant leader. And we also looked at the pattern of the Apostle Paul and his servant leadership there in Thessalonica. And we saw together that the Apostle Paul's servant leadership was fruitful. Not only was it fruitful, it was courageous. We also saw from the text last week that there was some things that a, a servant leader has to intentionally avoid to be the leader that God wants him to be. He must avoid deception. He must avoid people-pleasing and greed and authoritarianism. And so this week we're going to look at the flip side of the coin. We're going to not look at leadership this week. We're going to look at followership. See, what good is, is good leadership skills? What good is a, a servant leader if the people that you're called to inspire to action are indifferent, resistant, and so we looked at the truth last week that Jesus was the, the greatest leader because he was the greatest follower. And again, believers, God does. He wants to use us. He wants to make us into his type of leader, but he also wants to make us into his type of follower. So this week, let's look at followership. So successful leadership depends on responsive followership. Let's see it in the scriptures here in the church in Thessalonica. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 13, please. Let's look at their response to the Apostle Paul and his servant leadership. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this calls also, thank we God without ceasing, because you, church, because you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So here, the Apostle Paul, he has been demonstrating all of these leadership qualities in Thessalonica. All these wonderful qualities of a, of a servant leader. But, but all of these would be empty gestures if the Thessalonians had not chosen to follow his servant leadership. So the truth is, successful leadership depends on responsive followership. The Apostle Paul starts this paragraph, he says, I thank God for your church. I pray for you with, without ceasing and I'm thanking God for your followership. Specifically, look again, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because you have received the word of God which you heard of us. So specifically he says, I thank God for the way you welcomed the word. The word received, our English word received, is, is used two times in verse 13. Now in the original language, the word received is two different Greek words. Look at the first one again, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because you received the word of God. 
Now, the idea here is that openness, that receptiveness that was found in the heart of the, of, of the folks there in Thessalonica. The word here, received, is used a lot of times in the relationship between a, a teacher and a learner. And so he says, I thank God for, for the way you received the truth that I gave you. See, the Apostle Paul, he received the word from the Lord Jesus. And then the Apostle Paul was able to give the word to Thessalonica. And they received, they were open, they were receptive to the word. 1 Corinthians 15 uses the same word. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand. Again, verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the first word that describes their receptiveness of God's word is the idea of a, a pupil receiving truth from his teacher. But now it goes one step further. Go back to the text, verse 13. For this calls also, thank we God without ceasing, because you received the word of God which you heard of us. You received it. Not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. So they didn't just patiently hear these guys preach God's message. No, it went one step further. It went from their ears, their, their minds, to their, to their hearts. The word here is, and maybe your translation reads this way, welcomed. So I, I thank God, church, for the way you welcomed the Word of God. Not only heard it, not only understood it, but you embraced it. It went from your, from your mind to your heart. Oh, I thank God for that, church. The same word is used in Luke chapter 2, talking about Simeon in the temple. He took him, the Lord Jesus, just an infant. He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. So the same word is used here. Simeon took him up. Simeon embraced Welcomed the infant, the word that became flesh. Simeon embraced the Lord Jesus. And that's what the Lord wants from me, and that's what He wants from you. He wants us to embrace His word, welcome His word. Even if it tells us to do things we don't want to hear. Even if it commands us to obey things we don't want to do. Still to have that hard attitude of God is your word. And I want to welcome it. Because how much more valuable is the word of God than the word of man? How much more priceless? How much more attention should I give to the word of God? Welcome it, the scripture says. The Bible warns us against things that we don't want to surrender. Welcome His Word. So the Thessalonians, what did they hear? They, hear, they heard the Word of God from Paul and from Silas. And in this church, from this pulpit, what should you expect to hear? The Word of God. And how should we respond? We should welcome it. Welcome it not as the word of man, but as the word of God. So Paul says, I thank God for you, church, 
for the way you received, the way you welcomed God's Word. Romans 10 describes this welcoming of God's Word at Salvation Day. Romans 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Again, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. They welcomed, they embraced the Word of God. Let me ask you, is that the testimony you have in, in our church? Would your Sunday school teacher describe you as a person that welcomes the Word? I'm not asking you, are you an attentive listener? Praise God for attentive listeners. No, but are you a doer of the Word? Are you someone that, that comes to the Word and just wants to hear from God? Yes, it's through the Sunday school teacher. It's, it's through the pastor. But it is the Word. I have pastor friends that tell me horror stories about their church members looking at Facebook during the church service, looking at the, the sports highlights during the church service. I have pastor friends that tell me horror stories about uh, uh, church members looking at their watches during the church service. See, all of those examples are folks that don't have the, the, the heart attitude that God wants us to have towards His Word. This is how God speaks. The Bible is, is God-inspired Word. It's God-breathed. And so when someone asks me, Pastor, show me from the Scriptures where, where I'm to be in Sunday school. And my, my response is, brother, sister, listen, the Word of God's going to be opened. The Word of God's going to be taught. We're going to hear from God in Sunday school. That's why we need to be there. That's why we need to be in church faithfully. Sunday morning, Sunday night. Why? Because the Word. God's going to speak. God's going to minister. And He's going to speak and minister through His Word. Wow. What a gift the Bible is. It's our only authority. It's our authority in all things, in all circumstances, for all the ages. The Scriptures preserved for us. And so the Apostle Paul, he, in this text, he says, Church, I thank God without ceasing for you. I thank God for the way you welcomed the Word. And number two, I thank God for the way the Word is still working in you. Let's keep going, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in in you that believe. So yes, the Word did work at Salvation Day, but the Word kept working there in Thessalonica. The people in Thessalonica kept receiving, kept welcoming the Word. And so the Word kept working in their lives and kept changing them into the image of Christ. Hard times came in Thessalonica and the church was able to stand firm. Why? Because of their relationship with the Word. The God of the Word. See, this church faced severe persecution. And how did God strengthen them? It was through the Word. Now watch here in the text. As, as the Apostle Paul is going to make some parallels between the church in Thessalonica and some of the circumstances and situations that they went through and the church... The first church, we'll see it in the text, verse 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. 
For you, brethren, became followers or imitators of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things for your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, both who killed the Lord Jesus and their prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men. So again, he makes the parallel between these two churches. The Judean church, that would be the, the first church there in Acts chapter 2. He compares the, the persecution that they went through with the persecution that the Thessalonian believers. Both churches had suffered, have been persecuted by their own countrymen. So again, the first church, Acts 2, they were persecuted by the Jews. Severe persecution. You remember with me the stoning of Stephen. Later, the first apostle was killed, James. Peter was imprisoned. Severely harassed. And so he says, you've become imitators of that church. Just the way that church responded correctly to persecution, you, church, have also responded biblically, correctly, to the persecution that you've gone through by the hands of your own countrymen. See, you'll remember, we studied Acts 17 together. Paul and, and Silas, they enter Thessalonica, they go to the synagogue, and, and people start getting saved. And then you'll remember with me, there was a mob. A mob came looking for Paul and Silas, and, and, and Paul and Silas had to leave town in a hurry. Well, just because they left didn't mean the mob stopped. Just because Paul and Silas left didn't mean the persecution stopped. No, it most likely intensified. So here's a brand new church, brand new Christians. And they went through the fire. And what was it that undergirded them? It was the Word. It was the Bible. It was truth. That's what they needed, and that's what we need today, church. We need the Word of God to guide our lives. So again, the church in Thessalonica was very similar to that first New Testament church. They were similar because they both suffered at the hands of their own countrymen. They both suffered for the same thing. Go back to the text. It tell us, tells us why they suffered. Verse 14. For you, brethren, became followers, imitators of the churches of God, which is in Judea, are in Christ Jesus. So again, both churches, even this church here, suffers. Why? Because all that desire to live godly will suffer persecution. Why did they go through the hard times back in the first century? Well, it's because they were the true church. They were holding to the, the true doctrine, and Satan can't stand it. So they were persecuted. They went through suffering for the same reason, because they were, they were committed to the one true God. They were committed to the, the great commission. And so the enemy sent all kinds of persecution their way. They were also similar in the way they endured the suffering. See it again in the text, verse 14, For you, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things for your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that we might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, 
endeavored more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our joy, you are our glory and joy. So both churches, even though the hardships came, they endured the hardships. They didn't quit. They held their ground. Let's go back and be reminded, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, and you became followers, same word in our text, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So again, they endured the trial. They withstood the tests. They were triumphant in the persecution. The text says that with joy of the Holy Spirit, they endured the affliction. How did that happen? How is that possible? Be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. That's how church. How do we endure? How do we go through the fire? It's not through my power. It's not through my strength. It's through the Lord's strength. It's through the Lord's mercy we're not consumed. His mercies are new every morning. We're looking to Him. It's His power. You think Old Testament, just like the Lord fought for Israel, the Lord will fight for us, church. Think about Ephesians 6 and putting on the belt of truth. Why? Because the enemy's constantly throwing lies, especially during the storm. And the Bible tells us to put on, gird yourself with the belt of truth. Take the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith. That's how they endured, and that's how we'll endure, church. Keep on welcoming the Word of God. So here we see these believers, they endured. Some very difficult things, and they endured. And how they endured, they kept the Word front and center in their hearts. And believers, we must do the same. We must keep the Word of God front and center in our hearts. Hold your hand here and go to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Look with me please, Deuteronomy chapter 17. This is a unique text. The context here it is a time before Israel ever had an earthly king. But, but God gives them instructions through Moses on how this king should live. Look at the text, please. Deuteronomy 17. Look at verse 18 and 19, please. Deuteronomy 17, verses 18 and 19. And it shall be when he, this earthly king, and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book. Out of that which is before the priest the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Now again, context, this is before the king ever came on the scene, God lays out these stipulations, these requirements, these to-do, and the top of the to-do list is he must write his own copy of Scripture. I mean, what a requirement. What an undertaking for this king to sit down and, and to, to have to write out the, the first five books of the Bible. We're talking about a major undertaking. We're talking about a, a time-intensive process. But God thought it was worth it. God thought it was necessary. He made it a requirement. Why? Because God's king must be committed to the word, must be diligent in his study of the word. 
And you and I, we have to have the same hard attitudes. Yes, it's a major undertaking. Yes, it's time intensive. Yes, it's a process. But it's worth it. It's a requirement. We must study and show ourselves approved. Workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We must hide His word in our heart that we might not sin against Him. Christians, I'm just telling you, we can't do it without the word. The Bible and our relationship with the Bible must be the highest priority. Yes, you've got things pulling you in different directions and you've got reasons not to read. I feel it too. But I must come back to the truth. This is the key. The scriptures. This is the bread that God nourishes my heart with. I need the word and so do you. And so again, we're talking about followership. And as a follower of Christ, I must be consistently, habitually welcoming the Word. I must see my devotion time. I must see the, the preaching time as a time that God speaks. Because what's the other option, Pastor? James 1.22 but be doers of the word. It's the positive side of the verse. And not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Again, the Bible is talking about what happens in the life of a carnal Christian. What happens to someone who doesn't reverence the word. What happens to someone who doesn't embrace and welcome the word. The Bible says if you're a hearer only, you will deceive yourselves. There'll be some trickery that goes on in your life because you, you hear the word. You, you trick yourself into believing you're spiritual. You trick yourself into believing you're a man or woman of God. And the reality is you're a hearer only. You're going hungry without the word. You're starving. So the Bible doesn't call us just to be hearers. The Bible calls us to be doers. He's talking about our attitude towards the scriptures. See, God wants you to come to the word and, and he wants me to come to the word just wanting to hear, longing to hear from him. James talks about looking into the, the law of liberty, gazing into the scriptures. The Bible calls itself a mirror. Why? Because when I gaze into the scriptures, it, it reveals things in me. The Bible works. It shows me the impurities in my life. It shows me the, the blemishes, the, the blotches, the areas that need repair. And the Bible says for me to, to, to gaze into the law of liberty. See, the scriptures, they free me from the bondage of sin. The scriptures are what I need. So Christians, I leave you with this. The blessing is not hearing the word only. The blessing is in the, the welcoming of the word as a word from God. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for this amazing example of a, of a young church that welcomed the word. And Lord, to see the way you blessed because of their followership, their receiving, welcoming, accepting the word, Lord, oh, we want that here. Lord, we want your blessings here. And we know that there is a direct correlation to how we accept the word, how we welcome the word. And so, Lord, would you please would you give us a fresh hunger in our church for the Bible? Would you light a fire in the hearts of your believers again just for the study of the Word? Just a want to hear from God. Would you, Lord, please? 
Would you create this in our hearts? Would you continue to allow your word to do that work that we desperately need? Or please, help us this week to be in the word faithfully. Meet with us, Father. Teach us how to study. Teach us how to meditate. Give us grace to memorize. Give us grace, Lord, to put it into action this week. Oh, Lord, please, by your grace, may we welcome your word today and every day until we see you face to face. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. Praise the Lord for his word, for this wonderful example of a church that was on fire for Jesus Christ. So I challenge you now to, to think through the truths that we've studied today. Think through what your heart attitude is towards the Word, towards church, towards the preaching of the Word, the teaching of the Word, towards daily devotions. To be able to just sit down honestly before God and do some inventory. I want to challenge you today to pray through what steps would God have you to take to be more serious about the Bible. Maybe for someone watching, that's just a simple step of, of starting to take notes when the Word of God is preached or, or taught. For others, it is, it's notching out that time. I mean, just on your, your planner, just having that time marked out when you're going you're gonna to read, you're going to study. Maybe for someone, it's, it's just a commitment to memorizing Scripture again. I don't know what the Spirit of God is, is going to speak to your heart, but, but I know He's going to speak. Because the Lord wants to minister through His Word. So I encourage you, don't push this off to the side. Take time and talk to God about your heart attitude towards His Bible. Ask Him what spiritual steps He would have you to take that you might truly love the Bible, love the Word of God. If you're watching today and you do not know Christ as your Savior, the Bible is clear. Jesus is coming again. When He comes again, the Bible says He's coming as the judge of the world. And He's going to judge the world in righteousness. And friend, I am not righteous in and of myself. I have broken God's law. I have broken His commandments over and over, and I deserve nothing but His punishment. But God so loved the world that He gave Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ paid for all of my wrongs when He died on the cross. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be rescued. So whoever receives what Jesus Christ did on that cross as a gift, the Bible promises that person will be rescued. That person will be forgiven. Friend, what's keeping you from receiving Christ as your personal forgiver? The Lord wants to speak to your heart today. He wants to be your Savior. He doesn't want you to have a head knowledge of Him only. No, the Bible wants you to welcome Him into your heart, into your life. Friend, please, repent from the way you've been thinking, the way you've been going, and turn to Jesus Christ and receive Him today as Lord and Savior. If you have questions, we would love to take the Scriptures and show you what God says from His Word. Church family, we love you in the Lord. If we can do anything to, to encourage you, to help you, please reach out to us. Let us know how. Love you, the Lord. See you next time. Lord bless you.
Jesus Christ.